first of all, my name is Hadi Obeisi. I'm a director in uh, the digital and technology consulting practice at PwC. I specialize in digital transformation and I focus on digital government specifically. Uh, I worked with ministries, government entities and digital government authorities across the region, mainly in UAE, Saudi Arabia and even Oman here as well. Um, in fact, uh, my first project in Oman was back in 2013 with, with ITA, so this is 10 years already uh, today. Um, today, it's, it's my pleasure and an honor to be here with you to talk about integrated government, uh, as you'll see in the presentation. And I'd like to start by defining integration. So, what is integration, right? What is integrated? Um, if, if you have a it can mean many things to different people. If you have a business background, for, say, for example, you, you think about integration as process integration or cultural integration, operating model integration. If you have a technical background, you think about it more of APIs, interoperability, and you both wouldn't be, wouldn't be wrong, right? This is all part of integration. So what I did is I actually asked ChatGPT to simplify and, and really give the simplest possible definition of integration, not because Everybody is using ChatGPT now, not because it's hip, but because actually ChatGPT will give us the most common, let's say, or, or from its learning, the most uh, common definition that it's seen. This is by design. So I wanted to see what is the simplest definition that it can come up with. And this is it. So integration in its simple form, simplest form, means bringing things together or combining things to create a unified whole. So the words unified and whole are key in integration. And actually, when I asked also ChatGPT to give us the Arabic translation of the word integration, it's takamul. And I know this is obvious, so takamul, but it's interesting because it didn't choose tarabut or any other word. And takamul means, again, unification or becoming whole or becoming complete. So what is the key takeaway here? The key takeaway is you hear a lot about whole of government and unified government in, in this forum and, and, and elsewhere. And integration, really integrated government, is a very important foundational step to get to that unified whole of government approach. And now to talk about the integrated government and to define what integrated government is, we talk about the levels of integrated government. So starting at, at the very far end, of course, is siloed or not really integrated. Even within the same government entity, we can find different departments having different services, different operations, not talking to each other, not having their services integrated. And the focus here is, of course, on the services, although, as you know, to deliver the services, we have operations, we have teams working together, so integration covers the whole, the whole approach. But we're going to focus on the services because ultimately this is what we're offering as, as a government. So the next level of this is, of course, when agencies start enhancing their services, re-engineering their services, enhancing their architecture, introducing new platforms to have integrated services within each agency. So intra-agency integration. As, a, as an agency, we, become, we have platforms, channels, offering integrated services to our customers. The next level is when we go beyond that and we have cross-agency or inter-agency integration. Now we're talking multiple government entities coming together, integrating their services to offer bundled services, let's say. And ultimately, the, the highest level is kind of achieving whole of government integration. And by whole of government, we'll have more unified platforms. The customers no longer see ministries as separate ministries, as separate services. They deal with the government as one unit, as a whole government. The services are naturally integrated in the back end, and people don't see that intricacies or the individual services. So this is kind of the, the whole of government integration approach that we want to achieve. Now, let's give some examples, of course, just very brief examples of what integrated government uh, can, can look like. So, taking example from Singapore, for example, when, when a child is born in Singapore, the parents can log into Life SG, they can register the newborn, 
they will do it all online, they will receive the birth certificate, they can apply for the uh, newborn benefits, so there's uh, benefits in, in, in Singapore for, for the new baby. They can even register the baby for a library membership, right there, since, since they're born. So all of that is integrated uh, within that as a, as a life event. Similarly, applying as another example, student visa in, in UK. So gov.uk allows you allows international students to apply for a student visa, and that is a fully integrated process. Again, from submitting uh, for the application, for proving, f uh, providing financial proof, uh, providing the confirmation from the institutes. Uh, so the educational institutes also integrated to provide confirmation that the student is accepted to doing actually the visa procedures, to doing the medical and fitness checks and until they reach um, the UK. Also just going through different examples, marriage registration in India, there's a service as well that allows fully online marriage um, service as well, providing a digital marriage certificate, uh, applying for different benefits, changing the name uh, if required, and all of those procedures, down to even actually updating tax records and all of that, all through one integrated service. And finally, some example, an example from uh, the, the GCC here is, is TAM, as, as you probably know already. And one example I'm, I'm taking from TAM is how starting a business. So as we know, starting a business is a, is a complicated process. There's many entities involved, many checks, so TAM, one of the services, for example, is how to start a business from start to finish through one integrated service without having to deal with the different entities or the underlying services. Of course, there are many other examples and many other platforms, even in the GCC, of course, here that are either built already or being built today to, to, to achieve that, to achieve this unified government approach and government channels. So what are the enablers of, of integrated government? What do we need to have? in order to achieve integrated government. Starting, as we just saw, unified government channels, right? So this is the top level, this is the interface that our customers will see, whether they're individuals, businesses, companies, all of that. So that top level integrates the services and allows the customers to interact with us. And I wanted, I wanted to highlight here the, the, the plural form, channels. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should have just one unified super government uh, channel. There could be multiple uh, uh, systems and, and, and channels and uh, portals. This requires careful consideration, and careful design, because for example, things like mobility or transport, for example, may, may have different requirements that do not necessarily fit one, uh, the same channel that we do certain transactions in. So again, there should be unified government channels. This requires careful design to really know based on the, the customer, based on the needs, based on the types of services, how can we unify in the best form possible. Now, this is the top level. This is what the, uh, the customers will see. Now, underlying, of course, there are very important things, starting with leadership uh, and governance to drive collaboration. This is definitely the cornerstone. Without it, all of this will not, will not happen. So this, of course, includes a unified vision. This includes a, could include a national digital government strategy, related policies to that, performance management systems related, or the, the, the KPIs and, and the, the assessment mechanisms to, to ensure that, and uh, all of that in order to drive that collaboration. Again, this is the, a key cornerstone to all of this approach. The second one is streamlined services and processes. Before we get into integration and automation, we need to look at the services themselves. So how do we streamline the service? How do we redesign the service or redesign the operations and the process behind the service? The reason is many organizations um, directly jump to putting technology on the existing service or the process. So we end up with the same long service or the same long process. It's just made maybe digital or, or um, uh, integrated. No one wants to fill a 200 uh, entry form, right, to, to achieve an integrated service. But um, in, in a way, if we have a service A and a service B, the integrated service does not necessarily mean all of the requirements and the process of service A plus all the requirements and steps for service B equals the integrated service. We need to, to re-look at the integrated service, 
relook at the process of how it's happening, where are the synergies, where are the points that we can streamline and, and truly come up with a new, truly integrated service. The next enabler is digitizing the service, actually, paper, paperless transactions. This might come as obvious as well, which is, in this age, it's difficult to achieve truly integrated services without moving them to digital first. And of course, that might not always be fully possible. I mean, certain steps will remain physical, at least, until we figure out ways to digitize them as well. However, even services that require physical uh, presence, for example, medical fitness, for example, I don't know, vehicle testing, all of those things can be made as a digital experience. For example, imagine I can, um, I want to renew my vehicle registration, I receive a notification that is coming up and I have a month or two months to any time I want, just book an appointment and on that date I go to the test center in five, ten minutes because again I booked so that is already accounted for, I'm, I, I'm not going to wait five, ten minutes, I go to the coffee shop which is, could be part of the same experience as well and uh, I'm done with my service. So even services that require physical steps, physical interactions can be also uh, digitized in a way. And for example, the paperless transaction would be here that my vehicle registration, registration is issued as a digital um, copy, of course. Digital identity, so authentication and signature, is also a key enabler because Digital identity provides a common level of trust across the, the, the government services. It's also a foundation to integrate uh, between the different services. Imagine I have to create a separate online identity for each ministry, right, for, or for each interaction. Now, this provides one single um, platform for identifying, so for accessing, and even for signing documents, which is also eliminates or could eliminate some of the more manual steps that we're used to, like document signature. So this can be done digitally. Reference data management and sharing. And by reference data, we mean the data that will be owned by the government and by a certain entity and shared with the, with the other government entities. So the first step is to identify what this reference data means. This could be your identity, so an identity of the person. Um, their details, their address, their social welfare status, for example, all of these, we need to identify which ministry will maintain that data or own that data and how they will share it with others, make it available with the other ministries. Why is this important also for integrated government? Because number one, this um, allows us to ask for in this information less from the customer. This is already go going to be provided across the entities. And number two is this reduces the redundancy in, in having to store this information and potentially having the wrong information or not updated information in different, in different ministries. So having a, a good reference data management and sharing practice is key actually to also achieving unified government. The final one, which is also, we're not going to spend too much time on it, this is also obvious, having standardized and, uh, and uh, integration and interoperability. So having the write reusable APIs that are not also designed just for one integration, but more designed to allow different government entities to reuse services and to build basically more complex services on the services that we publish. This is also part of that design. And finally, a layer which probably you will, you will not see because of the chairs, the government shared services. So there is also a layer at the bottom which can be enabled uh, by the government to enable those um, different aspects we discussed. For example, a government integration platform that allows a secure way and an easy way for government entities to publish those APIs together or share the reference data together as well through a secure government integration platform. Of course, PKI or public key infrastructure for digital identity, secure ICT infrastructure generally. And again, this doesn't have to be built only by the government. This could be also in partnerships with, with, with the private sector. So as long as the government focuses on that layer as well as, as shared services. Now, if I want to tell you there's maybe one more level. So beyond a fully unified, integrated government, you'll say, you probably think, what is there? We, we just discussed about, you know, government singularity here. Like it's, it's all unified, one seamless experience. Well, I'd like to introduce 
maybe a term or a concept called invisible government. Now, this is not a very familiar term, to, to be very honest with you. So if you search for this, you'll probably get negative maybe terms like you know shadow government or conspiracy theory. but that definitely that's not what we're talking here we want to we want to change this to, into a more positive term and the reason why i chose the word invisible it's borrowing actually from steve jobs and others and, and many other uh, technology gurus who say who in a way that technology when technology becomes great it becomes invisible right so like our phones our all of those technologies that we use every day, we don't feel that we're using them. They're just an extension of us, right? It's, we're doing, we're going about our lives and they just happen to be part of our lives. And what if we can think of government that way so that it's so well integrated with our lives as individuals or as businesses that there's no friction. We don't feel like we're having to interact directly or, or forcefully maybe with, with the services, but they just happen. And in order to do that, of course, it starts with reaching that whole of government integration services level. We still have to integrate our services, having uh, unified experiences, unified uh, channels, because this will reduce the friction. This will create this amazing experiences and, and reduce that for, for our customers. And we'll still offer that services, of course, to the individuals and companies, G2C, G2P services, and others. One way also is to focus more on driving proactive services and cognitive services, which means, in a way, what if I can offer the service before the customer needs it, right? Be or be before the customer knows that it is required and tailor that experience to them. Um, going back to that, to that example I gave about maybe vehicle registration, and just a random example I'm, I'm taking. Again, what if maybe instead of me going to a vehicle test center to register my vehicle, what if this can be part of my regular checkup at the mechanic, for example, right? So what, what if I go regularly, and if I don't, I, it's healthy, right? So it's good to be notified that I should, every once in a while, go to the mechanic, have the vehicle checked. What if that check, that information about the health of my vehicle and its fitness, its road fitness, is also used to automatically, for example, renew my registration when it's required. So this is a, an example of how that service can become, in a way, invisible to the customer. So they're, they're maintaining their vehicle, but also they're renewing it and making it roadworthy. There's also another way, which is actually integrating with the private sector services. Okay? So what if also some of, some of the government services can be availed to the private sector so that they also integrate them as part of their own services and achieve truly integrated services to the individuals and, and companies. So this is the next level of integration between the government and the private sector. And of course, the private sector, it's, it's both ways, right? So the private sector will need to also maintain updates and triggers that would potentially trigger this cycle or these services. If, if you see the example I just gave, about the vehicle registration. So it's me going and maintaining my car at my mechanic. So the mechanic here is, is the private sector, right? And by offering their service, which is maintaining my car, I could potentially offer a service from the government that allows my mechanic to update that information uh, on my vehicle and issue my registration as well, or renew my registration as, as a private sector service. And there are many other services as examples. Of course, there will always be a direct from a government uh, to the consumer services. For example, ID-related, identity-related services like my ID, my passport, and other types of services. This will still require, the, the, they will not go through, through the private sector. However, there is a lot of other examples that can go through the private sector like real estate transactions through brokers or even through startups or P2P that can happen um, also through the same cycle. So, why, why invisible government? So why, why take this, this approach even? Um, of course, productivity and convenience gains for, for the consumers. So imagine if instead, again, of having to go and take a step, even if it's a unified service, but taking that step with the government versus it is just integrated in my day-to-day -day life. If I'm just, again, maintaining my vehicle or I'm just dealing with a broker to, I don't know, uh, buy property, and the registration, all of that happens as an enabler. It happens in the background. So this has productivity and convenience gains. It can provide healthy competition, of course, for government-owned channels. So when I certain services, I start allowing the private sector to offer it as part of their own services, 
I start competing with them, right? So they will help me also elevate my experience uh, of, of those uh, channels that I have for those services. Accelerating innovation in service delivery through co-creation with private sector, again, um, allowing the private sector to come up with new types of experiences, new ways to innovate by giving them this access to the services and allowing them or giving them the opportunity to, to really think uh, and through the integration of their own services, accelerating innovation. Enhanced government efficiency in service delivery through the private sector. Again, some services, as we mentioned, the government might decide, well, I don't need to spend that much on maintaining a, an interface for that service. For example, let's say this approach becomes so successful that all transactions for a certain service, or most of them, just happen naturally through, through the private sector channels. Let's say all vehicles are, again, back to the one example, all vehicles are just naturally being renewed at a mechanic, right? So why do I need to maintain that as a separate service anyway? So this can cause either lessening the, the demand on my channels, or at least maybe even um, reducing some of that. And finally, it's also potentially new monetization opportunities for government services and data. So if I can offer these services to the private sector so that they can integrate them with their own services, I can potentially think of ways to also monetize that, uh, both the services and the data. So now, just to give a couple of examples of invisible government. Um, if you know Haya application in, in Qatar, for example, for the World Cup, the reason I'm giving this example is because that one application, that one super app, it wasn't designed, I know it's a state-driven, so Qatar basically designed that app and, and published, it, published that app, but it wasn't necessarily, the end sake wasn't a government service. It was attending the World Cup, right? Even the branding is it. So it's a live event or, or an event that I would like to, to do. What they did is they created this comprehensive platform that is also integrated with FIFA, so with the ticket, ticketing system. And if, if, again, all of that full journey from when you plan to come, so you get the ticket to get the visa to arrive, and even when you arrive, how you book transport and other services, this is all through the, just that one you know, integrated experience. And this is, this is where I'm saying it's invisible because many of the underlying complexities or services are actually hidden. I'm just interested in how do I get to travel to Qatar, how do I get to watch the game and attend the stadium, for example. So this is, this is a good example, I believe, of uh, in, invisible government. The other one is Uber, for example. So directly taking a private sector example for for this, and I think it's in multiple cities, but I want to focus on uh, specifically United States. In multiple states, so Uber is fully integrated with the public transport system, which means that I don't even have to interact with the public transport apps to book a, an end-to-end -end journey, fully integrated journey. Some of it is through Uber, some of it curated by Uber, but is using the public uh, transport infrastructure. Again, this is made invisible to me. I'm, I'm here to plan my trip, I'm here to move, and it allows me as also to get more services than I would just get if I'm interacting with the government channel, right? Because it's, it's com being complemented by Uber as well. And it's vi vi vice versa, by the way. So even potentially the government might integrate with the private sector services as part of their own services and part of their own channels. So it's, it's a two-way street. So key considerations here to, for, for um, invisible government. Of course, first, designing proactive and cognitive government services. So we need to go beyond the just integrated and whole of government approach. We need to be proactive in our services to truly become invisible. So before the customer asks for it, I know that they need it. I know how we'll offer it and, and I will avail it to them. Mr. Hadi, Second is Excuse me, the offering head. government APIs um, through uh, a marketplace. So potentially I can have a marketplace where I offer the government APIs through it uh, to the private sector or to others. Publishing service design and interoperability standards. Of course, when I'm expanding the interoperability and including private sector, for example, and other entities, it's important to have common understanding, common standards, common uh, um, interoperability as well, to make sure that there's a minimum level that everybody is aware of, they're aiming for, and they're, uh, they are adopting. Uh, setting strong security and privacy controls. Of course, if we're including the private sector in this, and I'm sharing data, there should be consent from the customer, there should be awareness of how this data can be used securely and privately within the private sector. And f finally, of course, all of this, enforcing government, uh, proper governance and compliance across the different uh, private sector. Finally, this is my last slide. I just want to leave you ultimately what we're aiming 
is for citizen centricity, right? We, we want all of this to be really citizen centric in designing and services and offering and services. And I started the presentation by giving you a definition of integration. I also want to finish by giving another definition, which is collaboration, because it's very, very important. Collaboration is key to get all of this done. And if you search for the word collaboration, you'll get the action of working with someone to produce something. It's, it's not necessarily very uh, enlightening, but it is, it is true. The surprising part is if you do this search, you'll get also <laughs> definition number two. A treacherous cooperation with an enemy. He faces charges of collaboration. That was the first time I actually see that collaboration can be used as a charge, as a, as a term. So th what I want to leave you with this is let's focus on the first definition of collaboration and really work together on, on providing integrated government and citizen-centric services. Thank you. This is that.